Welcome to the final episode of our You Are the Dungeon series. This episode, Tracy Barnett joins us again to discuss the character creation in this system, how it compares to other systems, and how different this game is to the other games we've covered in the past. It has some really great discussion in this episode, and I can't wait for you to hear it. Of course, before we get to the action, first, some announcements. First up, did you hear the news last Friday? Amor Amaraz started up Season 2 of Cape and Blade, a Chimera actual play stream that blends fantasy and superhero genres together. They are actually playing in the same world as Season 1, but with brand new characters, and it was absolutely phenomenal. If you haven't caught the opener to the new season this last Friday, Check it out on demand at capeandblade.chimera.games, which will take you right to the Utopia channel on Twitch. I will have links in the show notes. This means that for a few more weeks at least, Chimera will be taking over Friday nights. Every other week, you'll be able to catch Cape and Blade, and on the weeks in between, this week being one of them, you can catch my stream, A Tale of Twinkle and Awe. We just finished a climactic battle last time, and our heroes deserve a bit of rest and relaxation. So join us for a beach episode of sorts, this Friday, starting at 7.30pm Central Time, live on Twitch at twitch.chimera.games. That was kind of two announcements rolled into one, and I'm not sure what else to announce at the moment, but stick around after the show for our call to action as well as the outtakes. For now, let's dive back in with Tracy and see what sort of fun discussions we got up to about this game. Enjoy! our discussion episode last time we created our characters for you are the dungeon this episode will be discussing the character creation process we are thrilled to welcome back tracy barnett designer of this game would you like to reintroduce yourself and maybe tell everyone at home about the character you we made has anyone ever just said no i don't want to reintroduce myself no, but would you like to be the first? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy, and I make games. I'm a, a queer, non-binary uh, game designer. I'm a podcaster. I do work for the One Shot Network. You can find uh, me anywhere online at the other Tracy. That is T R A C Y. My podcast is called Fifteen Minutes of Fave. I talk to people about their favorite thing for fifteen minutes. It's nice and light and fun not always light we sometimes get pretty deep in 15 minutes but it's good because i'm literally talking to the experts on their favorite thing which is the people who love the mm-hmm. things oh and my character uh my character was the dungeon yeah yeah because you are the dungeon uh yes i, I guess we can I, I think point like out we what specific are the dungeon yeah we are the dungeon i guess we Y'all can point out what, what specific room did you add uh in the beginning to the dungeon a very good question. I added the Temple of the Everflame mm-hmm. uh, to our our uh, bloodthirsty mermaid uh, desiccated coral dungeon that we built in the previous episode. Yeah, uh, the dungeon that was created by by a kraken. A kraken. Yeah. A kraken. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Amelia, uh, why don't you tell us about your addition to the dungeon? Sure. I created the dark chamber of the kraken which over the course of our recording uh, turns out to be just a room that calls to people with whatever it thinks will lure them inside and then hmm. traps them in there. This this sounds like a very messed up, uh, you know, uh, HGTV uh, reality show uh, contest. I would watch that show. What? 
Dungeon Hunters. Dungeon, dungeon Hunters. Dungeon Hunters. <laughs> <laughs> you have to look at three dungeons, decide which one's right for you, but you know yep. they pick it before they record the show. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. And then uh, they're always see, mad about the paint color, and you can <laughs> change that. <laughs> Um, I am a, a warlock a patron of the unseen one. My husband is a paladin of the righteous blight. Uh, we're looking for a lovely little craftwork dungeon, maybe something with uh, mortared stone, and our budget is one million gold. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we need it to allow chickens in the backyard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there has to be a chicken coop. The unhallowed chickens aren't going to raise themselves. No. <laughs> Ryan, please tell us about the room you created. So I created the bottom bottomless chasm of perpetual light, uh, which so ended up good. which ended up being a uh, combination angler fish and sarlacc pit. Uh, so it, it basically uh, lures people down with its promise of something uh, shiny down there uh, and then eats them. It's what every dungeon needs. It's true. All right. Let's go ahead and dive into our discussion segment. D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. All right. In this segment, uh, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. Uh, but first, a question about you, Tracy, as a designer. Uh, where do you feel like your best design ideas come from, or how do they present themselves to you? So we actually talked about this a little bit, probably off mic, maybe off recording, about like how well, we talked about how this game came from like a marketing meeting that I had with Jeff Stormer, and Amelia, her, her response was like... I, how does that like where's the linkage? Why there? does your brain do that? <laughs> <laughs> the the truth is that as I've been a game designer for more and more years, the route from a thing I saw in the world to making a game inspired by that thing, I won't say based on, but I'll say inspired by that thing, it has it it's an easier and easier channel uh to to have happen. So for example, um, now a year ago, just before all the, the pandemic stuff hit the U S and everything locked down, I did a nineties game jam on itch, uh, back in January of 2020, because the place that I work every Sunday, which is usually our slowest day, which I have time to be like, be on Twitter and mess around and whatnot is the nineties radio station day. Mm. So I hear a ton of songs from the nineties and I started a thread of song titles and the games you would make from them. So then I made that into a game jam because why not? It's easy to make a game jam on itch. I figured a few people might be interested and I wasn't going to make a game for the jam, but then I heard it's one of my least favorite songs that we hear. It's this thing we started by Brian Adams and it's just it's a buck wild song about like how you can't avoid my love for you, baby, because we've started this thing and now we can't stop it. Right. Mm-hmm. But I ended up making a descended from the queen game called this thing we started, which is about a monster breaking loose from like a research facility after some uh, Dr. Frankenstein types have made it. Mm. And you play the the doctors who are hunting after their creation. Oh, interesting. And I kickstarted it for Zine Quest last year. But the the reason I bring that up is because that was born from a really mediocre to bad Brian Adams song. (laughs) (laughs) And the content of the game has nothing to do with the song save for the title. Because sometimes there are words or phrases or images or conversations that I have that just stick in my brain. Mm -hmm. And there's now a set of machinery up there, I guess, that churns away at it and goes, oh, well, what about this thing? And because I am lucky to have experienced so many games and so many systems, I start like holding up possibilities really quickly and like discarding them, right? Like I start with 
everything starts with fate, right? Like, is this going to be a fate game? No, it's not going to be a fate game, but oh, it'll, it'll have aspects, right? And, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So with this, I was like, with, with this thing we started, I started going, oh, well, it's going to be this or that. No, it should be descended from the queen because we don't really know who the creation is. We don't really know who the creators are and it'll all be discovered by play because it's all questions and questions are my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> um, so when when you make games long enough or you do creative things long enough, you get like channels that are grooved into your brain that you just start following. Mm -hmm. And as long as you don't get too set in those ways, you can skip the track sometimes, right? You can jump to a new groove. You can keep doing innovative things. And so I don't worry about where my next idea is going to come from Mm -hmm. because I can't stop them coming. (laughs) Um, I literally, if you will, please wholly pardon me. I can't stop this thing I've started. Oh, <laughs> I will not pardon you. No, I, I <laughs> that's applaud totally that. fair. I applaud that pun. <laughs> Says the person who came up with Johann Sebastian Flock. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm still. I like. I don't know if I'm mad about it. I like it. I think. I think that's the thing. Is like I like it, and I'm mad that I like it. Those mm-hmm. are the best type of puns. <laughs> that, that yeah uh that that's how my wife feels about puns uh too she hated puns when she met and now like i don't know if it's like a stockholm syndrome thing or if she is just like slowly beaten her down <laughs> like I, I hope it's i hope it's not that i hope it is an a realization because i think when people don't like puns or 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 like simple wordplay i think there's almost like a just a lack of joy in that part of their brain because oh, are you one puns. of those people, though, that when I say I don't like beer, you're like, it's an acquired taste. And I'm like, I don't have the desire to acquire that taste. So, no, like, puns are just like, if you keep trying them, eventually. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think puns are. So it's that's a very interesting comparison because I love beer, right? Like I you both have talked to me yes. at various points in time. I sell beer as a living. Like, that's what I do right now for my day job. I fully, if someone says I don't like beer, I will probe a little bit Mm -hmm. because sometimes, sometimes it literally is, no, you haven't found the right beer. Right. But Amelia, you and I have talked and I know I'm not, I'm not going to recommend you a beer. It's not how this is going to (laughs) work. But I think that because of the way that language works, Mm -hmm. wordplay and puns are linked to a more fundamental enjoyment of how language is structured. Mm. Interesting. And I think that there is literally a place in almost every person who can appreciate those moments of what language does. Mm -hmm. It's just that they get expressed in ways and at moments that are usually grown worthy. Yeah. That it can make it really easy to go, oh, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Yeah. But I think that 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 puns and that level of wordplay are absolutely beautiful because they reflect the multifacetedness of how language can be constructed. They they definitely like it takes like a like I don't want to say a higher level of intelligence, but there's like a level of like mastery of language mm-hmm. that you have to have. Like they're not like this low level like, you know, so yeah. like my son thinks puns are hilarious and mm-hmm. and like I'm always shocked when he makes them because I'm like I didn't know that you knew that words could do that yet. Exactly. You know, and yeah, so it's it, like fascinating it's, to me, but I yeah. I think maybe you're right. It is just the moment or something. For me, mm-hmm. it's like when I make a pun, I think it's hilarious hilarious when other people make them it's no good (laughs) right but i i i think that part of that is every person's own individual brain makeup being disarmed by what the language did because it subverts expectations yes Mm -hmm. and so if you are not a person who is okay with your expectations being subverted like if you want to know what's coming if you need things to be more predictable for how your brain is wired yeah, puns can be really upsetting. Oh, but that makes so they, much sense now. They feel and and <laughs> like I mean I know you a little bit, Amelia, which is why I kind of went down that path. <laughs> yeah, but I like things just so. <laughs> but when you when you're the one that comes up with them, it feels clever. It does. It, it, I mean, there's there are, like it, the, it's a good the, moment. <laughs> there are, there are very few things that happen in terms of 
spoken or written language that are as intrinsically satisfying to the person saying or writing them as a pun or like a good lyrical substitution a la Weird Al, right? Yes. Like yeah. when you can when you can hit the nuances of multiple meanings or you can hit the meter and the rhyme scheme of mm-hmm. a, a line of a song and substitute in different words, there's something just visceral that clicks. Yeah. So I really forget how we got to talking about this, but I'm really glad that we got to say uh, well, Welcome yeah. to the first question of the discussion. <laughs> this it always goes it. this way, I feel oh, like. <laughs> it's fantastic. But yes, wordplay and puns are really good, and I will not ever malign someone if they don't if they say they don't like them. But that is a thing that unlike beer, I will say, no, I think that the context just needs to be right. That's fair. And even if that context is just you being the person in charge mm. of the wordplay, totally fine. Yeah. That's fair. Um beer's a different thing than that. That's a <laughs> it was a really good analogy, thing. but it's a really good analogy, but like I'm not gonna force my opinions about about alcohol onto somebody. I appreciate so. that. <laughs> I like root beer. Root beer's great. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> when you sit down to play a game, mm-hmm. what do you look for in a system as far as character creation? Like, what parts of character creation do you need to have for to like make a really great character in your mind? The more I play games, the less I am concerned about what the system itself brings to the table in terms of what my character is going to do or mm-hmm. be. Um, I. I run games more often than I play them. And I'm even like vaguely thinking back to when I was on this uh, show uh, last time. And I'm sure I gave some answer that was like, oh, it needs to have something about like who they really are, like aspects and fate. No, and, and this so on is and so a forth. different question because you were oh. on our show before. So I didn't uh-huh. want to ask this. So this is Wonderful. new and exciting. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> but anyway, um, The point is I'm not going to give an answer that is like aspects or fate or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I am in a a new D&D campaign with my group. Um, D&D, for all of its problems, and boy, there are a lot of Mm -hmm. them, is like the lingua franca for our group, right? So it's just really easy for us to settle in and play D&D. But I'm not running it this time. And I've run D&D for this group a number of times, and I typically just don't, don't play. So I really wanted to take time to be a better player this time around because I tend to play high charisma characters who can do this talky thing that I'm doing on this podcast right now, right? Mm-hmm. Who can uh, who can know things and just hold forth about whatever's going on. And yeah, I see, I see you there, mm-hmm. Amelia. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to play a different kind of character. So I'm playing a paladin who uh, was abducted as the mortal side of a changeling swap with the Fae Mm. and grew up in the Fae wild and is now back in the prime material plane and ostensibly hates the Fae, but left the Fae wild with an Eladrin who is another player in the group. Right. Mm. And on the verge, we started at level two. So in if you play D at level three is when the paladin takes their oath right the thing that they're gonna be against or for and i was gonna take the one that is all outsiders because like no that's all that's all bad but i realized it was more nuanced than that and so i'm gonna take the oath of the ancients and actually acknowledge the fey, fey wild roots and i say all of that to say that not a single one of those things had to do with what Dungeons and Dragons does as a system for me to develop the character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like there are systems that do a better job of that. Fate is a really good one, right? Because one of the mechanical parts of your character are your aspects, which are things that are true about your character. But as time goes on, I want to use the context of the story that's being told by the group and what all the other players are bringing to the table to define who the character is. And I want to evolve that definition as we play, recontextualizing the character through the events of the narrative that happens, whether or not the system says it happens, right? Maybe there's a die roll that's, that makes something dramatic happen and we use that as forward momentum. But maybe there, there's not. Maybe it's just decisions that I'm making about the character. And that's fine. Um, 
So I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of systems that uh, incentivize and mechanize character realities into the into the game. Mm-hmm. But if it's not there, I'm just going to just going to do it anyway. I'm just going to make my I'm gonna do my best <laughs> to embody the character that I want to play and make sure that I'm speaking into the narrative and that what happens as a result of that flows back into the character. Yeah, I think that more and more, a lot of us are kind of doing that with those with games that don't do that because i think that Mm -hmm. i shouldn't say like us but a lot of people who have kind of gotten used to playing story games and things when we go back to games like D &D, like we start throwing those things in there because it's like well i that should be there i should know these things about my character so i'm just gonna go ahead and like splash that Mm -hmm. as character background and Mm -hmm. just make it up and you know assume that these things are true because the game doesn't like do anything to dissuade you from doing that either there's nothing in there that says you can't do those things which is a really interesting lead into the next question that i see on the outline Mm -hmm. because yeah well ask the question and we'll just go (laughs) yeah Yeah. so so the (laughs) next question is ask the questions please (laughs) (laughs) no it is a great segue because uh i I would not dare to ask your own questions (laughs) Yeah, the next question is, how do we think character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've played? Um, and yeah, I, I want to hear your, y'all's answers first, because you have a huge breadth of experience. Yeah. Well, it's, games that we've played, no. Games that we've created characters for, sure. <laughs> Got a lot of that. <laughs> um, this is, I mean, this is unlike, you know, like we've done things like Descent into Midnight or something where you kind of create the world along yeah. with the game. But like, that's not what this is. Mm-hmm. Um, even when we did Anyone Can Wear the Mask, we created the city. And that's yeah. not what this is. Um, yeah, I, like, uh, I don't know. It's like I'm almost hesitant to even call it character creation because it's just like its own thing. Like yeah. it's. Like Although it is it, the game. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely it's the game. Uh, you, you're playing the game for the character creation. There's plenty of systems that do that, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I, One last job uh, does a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's there's quite a few others that I can't think of off the top of my head that you can't finish your characters unless you play through the game a bit, right? If not the entire game, sure, right? Sure, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, where whereas this is. This is the beginning of this dungeon's story. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about a place as character, a place has history, uh, but it has a beginning, right? And Mm -hmm. that's, that's just like any other character. When a character is, is old and, or on their last breath and, uh, the campaign is almost over, that character has history. But that character has a beginning, and that's character creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so much, much that same way. This, this, this is a very interesting counterpoint to uh, character as character turning into place as character. Um, mm-hmm. And and I really, I really like how it f- how it feels organic uh, in that sense that you're creating something historical. Yeah, that was a hundred percent intentional. Right. Because there are a lot of things that you can say about how dungeons are portrayed in games that include dungeons. Yeah. Right. And we talked about some of this at the in the in the previous episodes. But um, a lot of the time in a fantasy setting, dungeons lack context. Yeah. Right. It's just the place where you go to do the thing that you do in this game, Mm -hmm. which is to to, you know, beat uh, enemies over the head until golden XP falls out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted from, from all the inspirations that fed into this, as, as I talked about before, I wanted the dungeon to, to be the focus yeah. because in, in the context of a, uh, a really like classic dungeon crawl type dungeon. Yeah. You never defeat the dungeon. Right. Right. You survive it at best. Yeah. And I wanted that to lend agency to the dungeon itself. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you talk about a thing having history, you talk about multiple generations Mm -hmm. or um, 
even just iterations, like more people came into town and they hear about this place, right? So they go and, and check it out. Like you have to have interactions with the place for mm-hmm. the place's history to be known. So what does that look like on the place's side of things, yeah. right? If if you're, even if you think of it solely mundanely, right? The dungeon has no agency. The dungeon is not actually inviting in a new mm-hmm. entity. It's not actually expanding its own territory, whatever it is. If you've got the old warehouse on the outskirts of town, that is your your dungeon to start off mm-hmm. with, right? And people go and investigate it and it's haunted as all get out and they have to then leave and a few of them don't make it out and no one goes back there for like, five years yeah the natural progress of time is going to degrade the land around it maybe there's a a crevasse that opens up nearby Mm -hmm. right so it's this weird meta fictional thing of like maybe all this can be explained by natural you know time wearing things down Mm -hmm. maybe the dungeon is a sentient entity that is drawing evil into itself and is making this place even more cursed than it was before yeah the actual answer doesn't matter absent you choosing to tell whatever story you want to tell with it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I love about this game, um, and I'm going to compare it to anyone can wear the mask by Jeff Stormer. Please um, do. Is, uh, Cause when we did anyone can wear the mask, it, 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 it ended up, you could turn that into a, uh, a, a campaign, a uh, backdrop cranking machine mm-hmm. where you play a few rounds and now you've got more places, you've got more history, you've got more NPCs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's just like Here, ever building, ever expanding yeah. thing. And what what's brilliant about this is is if you're a GM uh for like a dungeon delving type game, you mm. could play a few rounds of this and get history for a dungeon and a map for a dungeon. And NPCs from that had experienced this dungeon. Mm. And now you've got new NPCs in the world that your players can meet. You've got a fully mapped out dungeon that is waiting to tempt your player characters uh, for the the stuff within uh, and all that sort of stuff. And that's that's amazing. That's an amazing. And you got to play your own game in the process. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's almost like that was intentional. I know. (laughs) <laughs> almost no, no. <laughs> for real like like i it's i'm really proud of this game like y'all you had me be. on for iron Edda before and like i love iron Edda accelerated mm. right you, we all know my feelings about yeah. that game <laughs> but in terms of of like small games like this have a lot less room for error right mm. because you you have to if you're doing a thing, you have to present it in a much more concise form and it has to do what you set out for it to do with not a lot of wiggle room, mm-hmm. right? right? It just has to do it. Or if it, if it doesn't, it just sort of falls apart a little bit. This may be the best thing I ever write. Like, and I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, I may do iterations or riffs on this, Maybe I'll surpass this someday, Mm -hmm. but this game, it, it's a game in and of itself. Like you said, Ryan, you, and and you can play it on its own, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be a self-contained thing, but the way it's set up, it invites you to use it for other stuff, right? It's just, it's there. Mm -hmm. And I tried really hard to use language that evoked that. And and tried to make it situated within a context, and it's a generic fantasy, mm-hmm. dark fantasy setting, like we talked about. But I tried to make it so that when you when you first started answering those questions, your brain immediately just gets lit up, like striking a match on the mm-hmm. side of a of, of a box, right? And you're like, oh, I could, and and off to the races. Mm-hmm. Yes, like that was exactly what I wanted to happen when you started playing this game is that it lit you up and it made you want to to go play a dungeon crawling thing or to or to run you know two or three rounds of the of the thing and find out why this dungeon that's out in the middle of nowhere 
that was constructed by a mad wizard has three different levels to it. Mm -hmm. And they're all populated with different weird evils. Yeah. Cool. Now, you know, Exactly. Yeah, I mean, so oh, we, yeah. we went through like a round of this game mm -hmm. and I don't think that there was any point where I was like, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to do next or like how to move this forward or like what I want other than naming mm -hmm. the people, which mm -hmm, we sure. all know. Which is always, it, is, that's the thing. Right. Yeah. Which <laughs> like I could have gotten over. I've got my stack of books. Um, but I mean, I don't think that there was ever a point where it was like, I have no ideas on what to do with this mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. something didn't evoke some kind of feeling or idea or like choice to make. Yeah. And the the language that I used throughout this entire thing, th this game is written in such a flowery fashion. Mm -hmm. Like if this were a novel, it would be called Purple Prose, right? It is <laughs> it is luminous and hanging in the air. Like when when you read uh, a sentence like I'm just scrolling through the game here real quick, but like decide who lives and dies. If there are any fractions, that person lived, but is less some of their original limbs yeah. or like you read a thing where it's like you let them go and uh, spare some room for future desecrations. Like I literally aside and I very deliberately did not use light and dark. Mm hmm to apply to imply good and evil like i was very deliberate about that choice because very often darkness is con is conflated with evil and that is a real problem mm -hmm. if you are a dark complected person uh if you are if you are melanated mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's not a good thing um but all the other words in the thesaurus that i could find like i wanted i wanted atrocities and depredations and in in inchoate horrors right mm -hmm. i want that language baked in there because you immediately recognize as a player, this place is bad. Yeah. This place is deeply evil in the ways that like watching Hellraiser, right, is deeply evil, right? It just, it, it needed to ooze all of that feeling mm -hmm. so that you are never feeling lost. Because all you, if you're like, oh no, what do I do? The answer is something evil, something <laughs> bad, Some what's going to happen to this person something worse than the first thing you thought of yeah i'm really proud of this game yeah no i mean i'm just looking at like the dispositions even that we have in ours prideful vintner mm -hmm. stalwart wanderer despised practitioner haughty ruler impoverished guide contemplative paladin apathetic shepherd like they're already like so descriptive that mm -hmm. it's it's easy to start working off of those things like you've given us enough structure like it's a very open game like we mm -hmm. could do mm -hmm. anything but there's enough little pieces there to start like pulling out you know like even the events too like the the fates um that we mm -hmm. developed for these people it's like it you know it was just enough a taste of something to evoke those feelings and emotions to be able to say oh no i think i've got it like i, I know what i want here yeah yeah yeah, and and that I I keep saying I tried really hard to do X or Y, but like this is the apotheosis of a lot of years of question based world building with players at a table, mm -hmm. right? Because um, both versions of Iron Edda that are out in the world, you build your holdfast because of the questions mm -hmm. that you're answering, mm -hmm. and so I've seen a lot of people answer a lot of questions, and I have found that. Just that taste, like you said, Amelia, is exactly what people need if they already feel safe and comfortable at the table, right? Yeah. Right. Like, the three of us have done this podcast before. We have played games in person before. We know each other. We're friends. Mm -hmm. All good. So, like, if you have that context of, of safety, and I know that I can speak freely now, when you get a taste of some idea... You can just run with it. And because this by design is a solo game. If hopefully you're comfortable hope, enough with yourself. It is my sincere hope that you are. Right. If 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 you are not, my heart goes out to you and I am here to support you and all your efforts. Mm. But like this is designed for you to sit down with yourself and go, what's the next worst thing I can do to these people? What does a knife in the dark mean? What does it mean when you're walking through these corridors and you get to sit down at an amazing feast? Mm -hmm. Like, 
it becomes grotesque. It becomes immediately horrific. And that was the point of all of it is like, no matter what happens in here, the dungeon is not good. It's not helpful. When you see a, a glimpse of a, of a spring meadow through a portal, that should scare the crap out of you. <laughs> and and that's that's how this game and, and not you. That's the other cool thing. None of this is happening to you, the player. You are the dungeon. Yeah. You are this source of evil. It's happening to another character. And so that remove allows you to bring a level of maliciousness Mm -hmm. that is both appropriate to the narrative and also doesn't harm you as a person. Yeah. Until you pack this up and bring it to your uh, your game of dungeon delving heroes (laughs) and submit (laughs) them to all the fun. Well, but even then, you're just bringing the dungeon. That's true. right? Right. You're not bringing this table of horrors. Oh, that's very true. You're just bringing the space you've created Mm -hmm. wherein you have maybe you've established that there are uh, there's a a cult of bloodthirsty mermaids Mm -hmm. in this underground. Yeah, I really want to know more about those mermaids. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now this space exists off the coasts of the kingdom of whatever in the land of Tralala and your characters are are gonna go and do that thing and if the context is this world is harrowing and dark cool how do you breathe underwater for one and two what are you going to do in a temple full of bloodthirsty mermaids Mm -hmm. wherein resides the ever flame the uh the dark chasm of the kraken and this the the massively bright thing that apparently eats people like (laughs) because that recontextualizes it again yeah i'm excited to like oh like how to see how each level as you go forward gets like more and more intense as we've you know build on all of these yeah. creepy things we've developed like and now you've got these siphonophores that moved in afterwards and, all right mm-hmm. and uh and who knows what else can can happen beyond that right mm-hmm. yeah and and the thing is everyone's gonna hit a natural stopping point Right. If you're playing this on your own, you're going to hit a point where you're like, you know, I've kind of told all of the gruesome stories that I want to tell. This game is very dark. It's not a bright and hopeful game. You know, it, it it's cathartic for at least a little bit, mm-hmm. I think, in, in the times we live in. But there comes a point where that's enough. Right. You want to put it down and you're just done. Mm-hmm. Like there's an account uh, that a Twitter account that started up in this person. I don't know who they are. Just a person online started uh playing the game and like wrote out i think the the last time i looked at it the google doc was like 18 pages holy cow of like generations of people that had gone to this dungeon and how it was expanding and the history like um there was one point in time where i referenced someone's great 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 grandfather's dagger that was left in the dungeon right like those linkages all got drawn they haven't posted in a while and i totally get it Mm -hmm. like Maybe life intruded. Maybe it's something else. Or maybe the story is just done. Yeah. And that's okay. Like, you can stop this game whenever you want to when you feel like you've had enough of whatever it is it gives to mm-hmm. you. Yeah. But also, like, more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know more about these mermaids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. Gosh. I. Uh, just like last time, I covered like a dozen of your questions in all of them. Well, this one I feel like isn't really, you know, applicable here. Like, yeah, I mean, we we played, we were playing the game. Like, we did play the game. Yeah, yeah. the character Play's, creation is yeah. the game. Yeah, it well, it, and it's it's a very indie, and especially like fifteen years ago, indie RPG thing, like the Forge era RPG thing, to say that character creation is play. And yes, it totally is. Like Apocalypse World is partially built on that mm. foundation, right? This is a game where play and character creation are exactly the same yeah. thing. Like the there amount is, of play and the amount of character creation are equal to each other. Yeah. And they're the and same. And there's, there's, there's no way to disentangle them. They are yeah. the exact same process. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So then uh, I know this is... It's character creation, world building blended into one, which I love. Uh, what would you say uh, is uh, one of the biggest flaws 
of this process and what is one of the best parts i i mean the biggest flaw is that you have to actively just choose to do it right because mm-hmm. it's a solo game mm-hmm. it's not like you're playing D with your friends or or pathfinder or fate or, or you know masks or whatever mm-hmm. it is there is no external impetus for you to play this game Right. You know, unless you've seen people talking about it and you think it's really awesome. Yeah. You have to choose to sit down and deliberately engage in this very specific process. Because if you if you deviate from the process as written too much, you won't get the same result. Mm -hmm. It's very prescriptive, Um, much like how Vincent Baker writes in Apocalypse World. If you are not running the game like it's written, you're not playing Apocalypse World. That's fine. You might get a really good story out of a game that's run like that, that's based on Apocalypse World. If you deviate from the formula that's set out in You Are the Dungeon, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like it falls apart very quickly. So if you are not willing to take the time and sit down and engage, you're not going to get anything out of it. Right. And it's one of those things where the biggest strength is also the biggest flaw right like the strength lies in following that process Mm -hmm. but that automatically means there are going to be people for whom this does not hit right because they don't have contextually the bandwidth or the patience or the whatever to engage with the game as it's written Mm -hmm. well and for some Um, people like role-playing really is about the social aspect mm -hmm. of it like that's a thing that we've talked about a number of times too there are people and i think i even my brother was talking about it too. He's like, I play games as a chance to hang out with my friends. So he's Mm -hmm. like, I've never looked at playing online or anything because it was about being around other people. Mm -hmm. And so solo games, I'm sure don't have the same sort of pull for those people that it's, you know, that's not what gaming is about for them. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's one of those things that like, cool. Yeah. It's the biggest flaw, but it's also not something I'm going to change. Yeah. Right. right. It, there, there's there's no reason to because it is so specifically what it is mm-hmm. that to change it would make it something totally different. And it, so, and I mean, really, we, yeah. we kind of proved that you can just do this solo game with three people. True. You mm-hmm. can put, put pool your minds together, create this, and if we wanted to make an evening of this and just do a few rounds, mm-hmm. and then and maybe build on it later and and just create this huge mega dungeon after a while. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. We totally could, you know, or you could pull out the semi sequel that I'm writing for it right now and do more different things. Yeah. <laughs> and and <laughs> it, it, it sounds like that will just create more background for this, uh, this, this world that mm-hmm. is implied that this dungeon yes. is in. Definitely. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm actually by the time this comes out, uh, you'll be able to find it on my Patreon uh, or on Itch. It's called "You Are the Tavern," and the idea is just I mean, it, on its face, very very simple. Mm-hmm. Just like the dungeon, you're playing the tavern, but the difference is you're not building out yourself. Like taverns don't do that. Mm-hmm. Dungeons are ephemeral you know, liminal spaces. Sure, a dungeon can build itself out and invite in new evils. Why not? But taverns reflect the context within which they're situated, right? If you've ever been to like an area bar where regulars come in, they're always talking about what's going on in town or what's going on with them or what happened in neighboring town. So what you build out in You Are the Tavern is the village you're in. Mm. So the stories that are told within the confines of the tavern reflect the world around the tavern. Yeah. So you're building a town by telling stories about the town through the lens of the people who come to the tavern. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's a very, very easy stretch. And there'll be language, at least a page in the game devoted to this, mm-hmm. that if you want to incorporate the dungeon into this thing. Mm hmm. Here's how you do it. That's very interesting. And, yeah. And it's a, it's an open secret. Like I need to have nice, easy things I can produce that can go on my Patreon and try and generate more revenue there. Yeah. So I've got a series of probably after the tavern, at least three more games that all reference the same implied setting that when you take them in aggregate, you are the campaign setting. That's awesome. 
That's I really like good. that. Yeah, because uh, uh, there are a few games out there that that handle like you know village creation or or whatever as part of the the session zero. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I I'm playing Beyond the Wall with my with my local group uh, lately, and the whole point is you build a village together. Your backstory is literally on your character. There's steps of the backstory that create uh, places in your village or NPCs in your village and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. It's really cool. But but then after your characters are all done, you know, then the village is kind of locked in. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's all surrounding the inn. The inn is at the center of town. The inn is the cornerstone. It's like the, the tavern inn sort of deal. And, mm-hmm. and that that's... That's kind of the same thing uh, with Hero of the Tavern, sounds like, where where you've got this cornerstone of the whole town, this tavern, this inn, um, and, and everything around it can be nebulous until it's defined. Yeah, exactly. And I think that one of the things that sets this apart from most ideas like this, it's a couple of things. Uh, one, the time scale is different between You Are the Dungeon and you are the tavern, mm. right? I, I read the passage in You Are the Dungeon that says, as years turn to centuries and centuries turn to aeons, right? Like the dungeon is long string, almost eternal, yeah. right? In You Are the Tavern, it's as months turn to years and years turns to decades. Mm-hmm. So if, you're, if you take a timeline of this implied setting and you chunk it out, like the dungeon can stretch all the way across the top like the dungeon is just around but the village might just have this little bit the tavern Mm -hmm. right like it just exists in this in this one point but then when i write you are the palace of dreams which is going to be the one that is like the the spaces that mortals dream when they fall asleep which is also where the gods reside like the dungeon suddenly becomes this, this small section (laughs) because this one is this much bigger. Yeah. So if you, if you decide to take all of these things and one's going to be like an empire level, like a big city, like a decaying empire kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you take all of them and you sort of play them with the same implied setting in mind, whatever that ends up becoming for you, you get these different slices of different spans of time. And if you were to choose to like take the implied setting and make it someplace you can play a game in, you find a point where there is a vertical slice that cuts through all the segments at the same time and you pop that out and you know that on a cosmological scale, this is happening on an empire scale. This is happening <laughs> oh. on the dungeons timeline. This is happening on the villages timeline. We are here. So, that sounds right? like a funnel. Oh. oh my goodness. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> totally unintentional, I'm sure. And and not like explicitly intended. Like I had not connected that up until you said it, Ryan. Mm. But you're hundred percent right. Like so many of the things that we do in games start at the broad and work to the narrow. Mm. And it's really important to do it that way. Like if you start too narrow you're too constrained and too confined and you can't really, you feel no agency in making your decisions. Mm -hmm. If you start too broad, Oh, I could do anything. It's like trying to come up with a name. It's literally that literally anything. Yeah. It could be anything. Okay. I've got nothing to go on Mm -hmm. here, but like with Ironetta, if you start with, these are your three pillar things, then you've got some context to operate in. And when someone asks you a question, even if you're just sitting at a convention table, you can hook back into that little quick thing that you heard the GM say, and you have an answer Mm -hmm. with, with this game or these games, you have context you're creating yourself. And the funnel is of like, you might not play them in order. I'm certainly not writing them in order, right? I didn't start cosmologically and then get to the dungeon and then get to the empire and then get to the villain. Like that's not how it's going to go. But when you, if you make the dungeon, you're like, okay, that's cool that this much has happened over this amount of time. And then you make the village, you go, oh, this fits over here, but only if you want it to. No one's forcing you to connect these dots. Mm-hmm. You do it if you, if you do it, if your brain is comfortable doing it and if you have an impetus to do it. Yeah. If not, 
you just play the games and enjoy them for what they are Mm -hmm. and have fun. Like, like I said, I may never write a better game than this. Like (laughs) there's, it, it, it does a lot of things that I want to see games do. And it's not like the impact of it. The, the cognitive load is not that heavy Mm -hmm. names aside. (laughs) Right. Besides that, it's good. Yeah. (laughs) Normally, we discuss our story. We have our fan mm-hmm. fiction section. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, do we, we... What else do we say here? Like, I mean, we... 20 more rounds. No. I, I, My I dog mean, is going to be hungry. We can't do 20 the, more rounds. But the, but the obvious answer is play another round. Right. Yep. Right. I don't know that we can take the time to do that, but that's the answer to the question. It's... There is no fan fiction section here because the fan fiction is what you take the time to do. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like all three of us in our own time, we have this, this Google doc. We can take it and make a local copy of it because the the people who are watching the podcast are going to want to see what we did. Mm-hmm. We could each just keep telling this story. That would actually be really interesting if we all just like played another round and see where mm-hmm. this goes. Ooh. Yeah. Because... That's what this game is. This game is an engine to just do your fan fiction. Okay. <sighs> we might have to do because, that. Be- I do love fan fiction. Do because fan when fiction. character creation literally is play, the line between where you want the stories to go and them actually going someplace, there, there's no line. Mm-hmm. It's just to, to, to quote uh, Mean Girls, the limit does not exist. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, that's our bonus content is just a couple more rounds of this. <laughs> uh, that's fine. <laughs> bonus content number one. Here, here we, we go. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so that's that's what I know this game is very different than what you've had on the show before mm-hmm. because they're when you're just making a character for another system, for another game, there's a finite there's a wall you hit right, right before before play. Mm-hmm. Yes. And like I jokingly said the limit does not exist, but that's what this is, right? right? As you, as you create a character and you get closer and closer and closer to play, you have to stop because functionally there's nothing you can do to cross the wall. Mm -hmm. But with this game, there's nothing to stop you aside from the time that you take to do it. You are the wall. No, you're the dungeon actually. (laughs) You're like like four, four walls. Maybe. I don't know. It might have 12 walls. We don't know. We don't know. It's hard to say. We won't know till we play. But yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. And, and literally playing to find out what happens, playing to continue the story, playing to see what becomes of the dungeon, because you have this assurance you're never going to stop existing. Mm-hmm. And even with, with the You Are the Tavern, like there are going to be events that happen because it's going to be divided into seasons, right? Mm-hmm. It's essentially planting, growing, harvesting, and enduring mm-hmm. are the four seasons. There may be things that happen that diminish the size of the village around the tavern. But like, even if you get to the point where you've diminished, say you get bad, bad, quote unquote, bad rolls, and it diminishes all the way down to the fact, well, the last building's been demolished and the tavern's in ruins. The story isn't done. Someone's going to come along in the next growing season and like settle in the ruins of the tavern. Mm-hmm. And it will be an, it will be a safe space again. So all of the things that you are in this sort of game series have a permanence to what they are, at least conceptually, mm-hmm. that they can be inhabited by something and, and carried forward, even if the linear history of the place has big gaps in it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So this is the part we re- would uh, take it up level. Uh, and get into our advancement discussion. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Well, yeah, I mean, there's not really leveling up in this one. I Mm-mm. I did put a couple questions in here that I thought we could kind sure. of, you know, talk about. Um, how does the fact that this is a solo game affect how much you can advance, both mechanically and narratively? It sounds like not na- mechanically, it just, you like, you just keep, doing just the same cranking. thing mm-hmm. you just keep you yeah. keep plugging along <laughs> yep but but narratively i think that this then becomes an exercise in how much 
effort or creativity you choose to put into uh, what's going on. So at that point in time, the limit is you, right? And your own context that you bring to things, Mm -hmm. which is why I specifically say that you can take time between phases Mm -hmm. because everyone who's done anything creative knows that you cannot just output and output and output and go and go and do ad infinitum. It just, you have to stop at some point in time. Yeah. And I think it's actually a really good metaphor for the, the phases in the game, the foray and the fallow. Like even in life, we have to have times where we're just not doing anything, Mm -hmm. right? Where all of the aggregate knowledge or learning that we've gained has a chance to like settle into who we are Mm -hmm. so we can make it part of ourselves and then go use it. And so the game is like a model for that almost. Like if you get to the end of a of a fallow cycle and you're like, I don't really want to bring in any more adventurers right now. Cool. You stop. Mm-hmm. You put it down. You walk away. You do something else. And if at some point in time down the road, you're thinking about that dungeon and you're like, oh, I wonder... Oh, I put a scything blade trap in that one part. I wonder what's going to happen with that. Then you pull it back out and you bring in some adventurers. And even if you you finish with the foray section and you're like, "Mm, really not sure about inviting in a new evil entity. Don't feel like drawing some new boundaries. Don't feel like expanding right now. Cool. You stop. Mm -hmm. And if at some point in time you, you start wondering what new degradations have populated the level that exists below everything you've written so far, then you go and write it. Like, yeah, that's, that's the, because it reflects who you are as a person in the moment that you're doing it, it's going to flow with the rhythm of your life and how, who you are in those, in those given moments. And if you were to play a game like this, uh, you know, now, and then you put it down and you don't look at it for five years, just like anything, any other, any other creative thing you've done, you're going to look back at it and go, I see who I was then. That's not exactly who I am now. Mm -hmm. Can I continue this now? No, maybe that's not a path I want to go down, but maybe you start a new dungeon to carry the metaphor forward. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's very, it's very poisonal. Yeah. And I I like how it creates an artifact, right? It, Mm -hmm. it, when, when you're drawing these things out, it creates a physical artifact that, that has the record of what happened at this place. Yeah. That's why I say in the instructions that it's preferable to print it out just because so many of the things that we do in play do not carry physical artifacts with them. And especially because of the times we live in now, right? You're doing a lot of gaming on different online platforms. You're using D&D Beyond, whatever it might Mm be. But with this, you get to make a physical thing Mm. if you choose to. Yeah. I don't ever want to feel like there's a pressure, right? Because I want people who don't have the access to physical media to still be able to do the thing. But, you know, if you have the option, it's a really cool thing to be able to do because then you've got the dungeon like in your, in your hand <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah absolutely um and i know there it, it there's no real uh mechanical advancement aside from play the game more uh it, it's play it's play the game over but you're advancing who you are as a person yeah. mm-hmm. as you're playing it like and boy that's a weighty kind of thing to contemplate right like that's a pretty existential like oh god i have to be a better person or a different person (laughs) or a grown grown or regressed person to for it to be different yeah but the reality is that's just what happens in life Mm -hmm. like you're not the same person that you were yesterday and you're not the person today who you're going to be tomorrow there are infinitesimal little changes And all of those get reflected in the kind of creative play that you do. And this game is just a reflection of who you are in a given moment. Mm -hmm. And see, like, I'm more okay with, like, narrative growth than mechanical growth. Not that I'm not okay with mechanical growth, but I find narrative growth more interesting and more appealing in play Mm -hmm. than, like, I I would rather play a character that is mechanically the same forever and ever and ever (laughs) than I would... You know, like, I don't want to, part of this is, like, I don't want to have to learn new mechanics. Like, don't make Mm -hmm. me learn a new (laughs) rule for how to do a thing. Um, But narrative growth is just more interesting to me as a player. I know that that's not true for everybody. Totally fine. Um, Mm -hmm. But, like, I I would rather have 
narrative growth than mm -hmm. or change not even necessarily growth but um then mechanical numbers go up like I yeah don't know. i know that's very satisfying to some people it's just like watching numbers go up <laughs> like yeah. yeah i mean great and, it, and, it, and it's not like you're working towards in this game like a level 40 dungeon or right. something like that right, right. Yeah. yeah, unless that's a goal you've set for yourself right. and you choose to go. And, and if so, great. You're also the one in charge of deciding that you don't want to keep going if you don't want to keep going. True. true. Absolutely. You know why? Because you mm. are the dungeon. That's true. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? It's a, it, Isn't it amazing how well that actually that's works? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it works great. I love it. That's so well, good. is there is there anything else then, Tracy, that you want to say about you are the dungeon uh, before we head out? Go and buy it, maybe. Yes, like, do I, like honestly, I mean, so much fun. Yeah i i I like all the games that I've made. Um, this one is this one sits with me more than than many that I've made. Like it's kind of like Iron Edda, right? Mm -hmm. I can't stop thinking about yeah. it. And and that that granted, you know, if if you're using your own emotions as a gauge for what to engage with, it's always going to be at least a little bit flawed because you can never right completely tell if you're being honest with yourself mm -hmm. or if you're. I think there's yourself. something to be said though for like but, what you said before about like if this is the best thing I ever make, I'm okay with that. Exactly, um, but like there are things that. For better or worse, as a creator, I have to accept that I'll never be able to let go. Mm -hmm. And whatever that means for me, if it means a lack of cre of commercial success or if it means that people are going to buy my stuff in droves, I have to be okay with the idea that there are things that I've made that I cannot stop tinkering with mm -hmm. or or making. And Ironetta is one of those things. Mm -hmm. Like it will it will I. It won't leave me alone. Yeah. That's fine. I have to accept that. I'll make new things for it as I'm able. Mm -hmm. I think this is another one because when I see the reactions that people have when they play those games, when I see them buy in to the process that the games offer and I see the, the engagement and the joy and I know that there's something there, then I realize that I've made some great things and the only thing stopping them from being perceived as great by the world at large is the system that we're operating within, which is capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that can, you know, what a bummer. This is capitalism, a family, it's, huh? a, it's a family friendly <laughs> podcast. So I'm not going to finish that sentence, but you get where I'm going. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I, there's, there's a, there's a dividing line between what I can expect to happen and what will happen that I have to be comfortable with if I'm going to actually love some of the things that I've made. Mm -hmm. And I'm okay with that because Ironetta and you are the dungeon, uh, as like template for gameplay are two things that I've made so far in my career that I just adore. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't ever want to feel like I need to apologize for that. So I'm not gonna. Yeah, absolutely. Nor should you. <laughs> well uh tracy thank you so much for joining us uh to talk about you are the dungeon uh thank you both for having me on again i hope that this has uh helped ease your respective marches um <laughs> yes because because that was kind of the original yes. impetus i things that life does not stop but uh, I had room to help bring something, I hope, uh, pretty cool into what y'all are doing. No, this yeah, was so a I'm lot glad. of fun. Like, first of all, it's always fun to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, but like, Aww. this is, a, okay, I'm I'm not going to lie to everyone here listening to this podcast. I totally bought the game while we were recording because I was like, <laughs> I'm tired of listening to you read off the things and I need to be able to read them and see them too. And so I did. And like, it's very cool. It's it very, very cool. cool. Like, that's it's, awesome. I mean, it's only 10 pages, 11 with the cover on the PDF, but mm -hmm. like, I totally, 
I, like I'm very excited to sit down and uh, Ryan. I hope we do this for some bonus content to sit down and like make some yeah. more, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll a couple have more to, generations we'll have to, of dungeon. We'll plan that. I I agree. This would be super fun to to throw out there. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that'll be some bonus content at some point too. Absolutely. But this was so much fun. This was so much fun. Good. I'm really glad. Um, if those of you listening want to buy this thing, you can find it on my itch.io page, uh, which is the other Tracy uh, I think it's up on drive through RPG it is. as well. That's where I found it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can go and find it. You can find all my other games there as well. You can listen to 15 minutes of fave. You can find it on Apple podcasts or Spotify or all that other good stuff. You, I'm not difficult to find. You can find me online. Just look for the other Tracy. Just shout pretty loud. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Go find my stuff, please. If you like this, go buy my stuff. And uh, whatever you do, whether it's my stuff or not, I hope you're enjoying yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for sitting down with us. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. We will be back in a bit. What a fun time we had creating this dungeon. I think Amelia and I are going to plan getting a round or two of this uh, recorded sometime after our next series gets recorded. So you'll want to keep an eye out for that on the One Shot Network Patreon. For those that are giving $5 and up, you'll get access to this bonus content when it's available. So definitely check it out at patreon.com slash one shot podcast. Uh, donating to the Patreon gives you all sorts of other great perks, and it's really a great way to support a group of great folks. Uh, paying for hosting for all of these podcasts on the network equipment repairs or replacement and so much more uh, is basically where your money is going to um, and i guess we're right into the call and action off the bat uh, so one of the thing i'd like to point out is the new cape and blade season two that is going on every other friday on the utopia channel on twitch uh, but also my stream a tale of twinkle and awe also every other friday on alternate fridays at 7 30 p.m central time at twitch.chimera.games i really hope you'll stop by to check it out uh either one or both of these streams uh you know this game is uh something truly special to me and i really love that we're able to show it off like this other than that i just wanted to remind you all that we are still in the need of more reviews uh, to get us up in the rankings every review really helps us out and helps new listeners find the show and the more that listen to the show the better we're just about to hit our three-year anniversary on april 2nd three years and really it's so wonderful seeing you stick with us week after week and enjoy what we have to offer i love what we are doing here so much and i'm really glad we get to help showcase new systems in a way that not many podcasts out there do and getting some insight from people very familiar with the systems or even the creators themselves has been a really great joy of mine as well so you know would be a really awesome anniversary gift for both of us more reviews so head on over to one of the links for Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or Stitcher that we have in the show notes, or leave a review anywhere else you can leave them, and let us know on Twitter at CreationCast. We would love to hear from you, and we would love to see you talking about the show more online. So in the meantime, thanks for listening. Enjoy the outtakes after the credits. Take care. Stay safe and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast 
or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you will find other great shows like Total Party Kill. Total Party Kill is a weekly live Twitch stream where John Patrick Cohen, Eddie Klinker, and James Dugan play through Cephalofair Games' Gloomhaven. Join them in the stream to play along through the action and interact with a constantly changing cast of characters and special guests, or watch them after the fact on the One Shot YouTube channel. TPK airs Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Time at twitch.tv slash one shot RPG. I did it. I did too. I think maybe just like a tiny bit late because my little trackpad is, mm. but it'll be okay. Yeah. We're all clicked all up right. over We're here. All clicked up. We're all clicked up. All right, I'm going to go for it. God, look at Tracy. They're all clicked up over there. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> mm. Still a little too warm, but that's okay. I always forget that in <laughs> Google, like you can't in the like the slides app and the docs app and stuff, I can't use my Apple Pencil, and it really bothers me because I pulled it up on my oh. iPad and was like, oh, I'll be able to write in there and draw, and, and it, it won't let you. Oh, that's sad. I know. Weird. It's a bummer. It's because they're like, mm, yeah. this is Google, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> ma'am, this is a Google. <sighs> <sighs> okay. All right. Um, so everything should be all set. Um, I don't know if we're going to have to alter any of the verbiage about what our characters were in the episode because we are the dungeon, right? Did I... I thought I took yeah, we, some of that out, but I might have missed some. It it's a little bit different, but I think it's fine to to intro it in that way, and then to remind everyone that this game yes. is really different. Yeah. Um, because there you kept in the tell us about your character section, but like I like the idea of starting off with that, and all of us going. Yes. Uh, it was us. Yeah. It was all us. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your dungeon. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, if we are all set, uh, I can do five seconds of background silence and then uh, we can get going. And I can do five seconds of background okay. noise. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't, don't do it. <laughs> I'll stop snarking. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. All right. Here we go. I got to I got to count with my right hand because my left hand's broken. All right. Here we go. Do we have a soundbite of that? I feel like we, we do. We do. We do. Yes, we do. Oh, oh yes. I was going to say, if not, we should all three just say it with the same cadence, and Ryan can real quick just cut and layer them over each <laughs> other Let's so we can all dungeon. be there. <laughs> well, that, that's what I did for uh, Amelia and I. We accidentally said, let's make a place at the exact same time one point. I, yeah. didn't even have to, I didn't even have to fix it at all. It was like literally perfectly lined up. <laughs> what was that for? I don't remember. remember. It was like one of the first times <laughs> that we had to make a place. Yeah. That's awesome. Do you have, do, do I need a tarot deck? I have one. Uh, no, no, I no. Have one, um, but. 
Okay, I don't um, know where my dice uh, are, so. I think that's one that's thing okay. that I, I don't I, have in here is a tarot deck. I, 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 I have the one, D, but... I have the D10 and a tarot deck, and since it's technically a solo game, like, I'll just deal out the cards okay. and, we'll, you and we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, like I said uh, before we started recording, my whole goal was to make this very easy yes. for y'all. So I have, I have got you covered. This is, you just get to exist in this space and make a dungeon with yeah. me. It's your game. You're on our show. You bring the tarot deck then. <laughs> this is this is one of those special uh special experiences where the person who's on the show is a friend and cares more about you Aww. two as people than they do about the show <laughs> and so i am bringing my knowledge of the show and my love for both of you to make this so just buttery which smooth i i so sincerely appreciate <laughs> like i can't it even tell like, you it, <laughs> it seemed like you both needed it like, so mm-hmm. i thought i would help yeah much appreciated Okay, so Ryan, what's up with your left hand? You said you broke. Uh, it's broken. It's, uh, it's not broken. Per oh, se. okay. It's I was just, like, you I, didn't I, tell I, me you broke your hand. <laughs> so a stupid thing. Okay, so this is an aside. I'll get put into the outtakes. I'm sure. Um, for like two months, I've had some weird like issues with my tendons and muscles and stuff that have mm. gone from my wrist to my elbow, and and right right around here on my wrist is like a a pain point. That if I do anything, mm-hmm. it just like is like somebody's jabbing it with a needle mm. and it hurts really bad. I got some p- physical therapy on it. I had worn a full hand brace for a while, but that wasn't doing anything. Mm. And then they gave me this dinky little thing. Uh, it must it's hit just like the right spot it's, or something. Yeah, it's like, it's like there's this circular thing on there, if you can see it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And that goes over that little ball in your mm-hmm. hand. Yeah. And then these things yeah. stretch to kind of like add a little bit of squeeze pressure to like both sides. Huh. So then huh. it squeezes both sides and it just holds it in place. So now I can do this without my hand screaming at me. Oh, that's right? really nice. If I take this off, that will like be almost uh, just like gut wrenching pain. That's really nice though that it's like not in the way and like it's so. It is so much nicer. Because I have like a full like hand one because I have really bad carpal tunnel because fun fact apparently pregnancy can give you carpal tunnel so (laughs) um at like 24 i had carpal tunnel and i still do um and those ones are like a full hand one and let me tell you during a pandemic when you need to frequently wash your hands taking that Mm -hmm. constantly on and off to like (sighs) yeah i haven't found a better one what i have is carpal tunnel because it's not like much on the underside per se yeah if it goes down like the side it's it's like all on the side and then like there's some muscles right up in here yeah and being able to do like this wouldn't be yeah i still can't do certain things i can't like press against stuff yeah because if i do that it like just shoots pain right through (laughs) here but um i mean like bracing against a wall going up the stairs or whatever that's that's out yeah. I can't use the railing huh. with my left hand easily. Uh, You're right-handed, weird. though, right? I am. Okay, goodness. that's good, at least. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of those normal people. <laughs> so boring. <laughs> okay. Uh, an indication that I am using my weird tarot deck that is uh, <laughs> a card that does not actually exist in the high arcana of the regular <laughs> one. I have time, which... I think maps to me drawing a new card. Let's go. <laughs> Let me get back to the outline. Yeah. Okay. We'll do our, our closer now. Yeah. Is that- mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Should we stop recording, right. Ryan? Yeah. And okay. we can stop recording for this session. Um, and mm-hmm. then. Okay. I did it that time. I also did it that time. Correctly. I mean, I did it before I did too. I did it that time but- too. <laughs> Too soon. Too soon. It's fine. Oh. Totally unrelated, but since I want this on a recording so Ryan will hear it later. Ryan, I am extremely proud of you that you're out as non-binary. Oh, well, thank you. I think I think that every non-binary person needs to hear that, especially people uh, like myself who mm. uh, present masks to the world, because that is... Not a thing that people expect when you say non-binary. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, being being demi uh, gendered is uh, it, it's definitely something that not many people are used to hearing about. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly didn't know it existed until I read the word. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah. And then I'm like, this makes too much sense. <laughs> I I had to explain like being non-binary to my mom because like I think Ryan, you knew about that whole thing with my sibling school and mm-hmm. like you you posted all about yeah, it. I saw it all. I mean, too. And it was like so. My mom like my sibling like left a note and then like had to run to school and my mom's like explain. <laughs> I was like. <laughs> Where do I start? I don't. Okay, <laughs> oh. uh, your daughter's not your daughter; they're your child. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've been really it's like frustrated the start of a and Hammer about like song. <laughs> the like, like for parent even like you're going through this that like the lack of words for things like mm-hmm. what do you call your parents' sibling? It's like there are stupid words like pibling or something like that that are like stupid mm-hmm. and you know so like they just call them Mars. It's like, luckily, mm-hmm. my sibling is young enough that they're they're 13 years younger than me and only 11 years older than Nate, I think. Mm. So, like, mm-hmm. closer in age. So it's totally fine to not use, like, aunt or uncle or whatever. But it's like there just aren't words for things. And mm-hmm. it's like, why? Yep. Why? <laughs> yeah, like, I encourage my family very strongly to use they and them. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about uncle. That doesn't, right. there are words that don't hit me weird right. that don't make me feel bad gendered stuff. Yeah. Uncle's one of mm-hmm. them because I just don't care. Um, I like dad. I'm fine with dad. Non-binary dad is actually a pretty cool look. Yeah. For me. I'm, I'm, I'm totally here for that. Um, I don't like father. I don't like daddy. Hmm. Right. Like those, no, those don't, those, those don't hit right for me. Make me uncomfortable um, even as a woman. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, there's just, there's a lot of, for me, there's a lot of patriarchal, yeah, and also just weird mm. stuff associated yeah. with those two that words. Makes sense. But like dad vibes, I'm cool with dad mm-hmm. vibes. That's like a that that's a that's a a sleeve I fit into. Mm-hmm. I think that's a pretty, thing too that like a lot of people neatly. don't understand is that like your level of like okayness with things on the gendered spectrum are different too. Cause like it took mm-hmm. my mom a minute to realize that like my sibling totally still okay with like dresses and having their room painted pink. Didn't, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, but don't call me by my old name. My mm-hmm. mom gets super mm-hmm. offended at the term dead name. She was like, great. Well, it hurts my feelings. And I was like, my mom's one of those people that it's like, it's about her and you have to like accept that yes. it's about her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had to tell my sibling, I was like, just refer to it as your old name. Because it hurts her feelings because she picked that name for you. And now by using saying dead name, you're like offending her and telling her that you don't appreciate it. And my sibling's like, but I use my middle name instead, which was named after her dad. She's like the first (laughs) name she picked because it sounded nice with the middle name. So she's like, shouldn't she be less angry about the middle? (laughs) It's like, I'm like, it's 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 a whole thing. Just don't. It's the phrase. The dead has a lot of psychological weight to Mm -hmm. it. So if you just say old, it and it's it's tough. I I remember because I between Twitter and all the discords were on together. Amelia, I have no idea where you were talking about this, but I remember seeing you talk all about Mm -hmm. it and how like the age of your sibling factors into it because they're just like, no respect. This This is the thing. And they're so hardcore about it. And like, there's no nuance to bring to your mom who is super sensitive and it all has right, to be about her. Right. Like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fraught and it's weird. And I mean, and like when I, like when my mom found out, found out I was bi, it was sort of like a similar style of conversation to the point where she was mm-hmm. like, great. So your whole marriage was a sham. And I was like, I mean, it it was, but that's not why. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a whole other thing. Um, but like, you know, it's like, great. So now you've lied to me for all of these. It's like, no, I haven't. I haven't lied to you. I just didn't bother to tell you. And here's the thing. He knew I was by before we were married. Like he was fully aware. Mm-hmm. Everybody was on yeah. board. It was fine. It's like just. Yeah. And then at a very practical level, who, why do you care who the. Oh, language. I'm attracted to. Well, you Brian. Yeah. I mean, cuz cuz yeah. you'll go to hell. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's that's, right. that that's that's valid and also doesn't matter I mean, at all. Yeah. Also, like, yeah. yeah. Don't use birth control and don't, you know, like we're like those kind of people. Mm. Yeah. This will make for some fun outtakes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I keep I keep yeah. every birthday and Christmas now though I buy my sibling whatever like non-binary stuff I can find. Mm. So like I mm-hmm. bought them for their birthday last year a shirt that says all they every day. 
And this year I bought them a shirt that says ladies and gentle thumbs. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> just so that they can wear it around the house around my mom. <laughs> um, you should get, I'm sure you can find it somewhere. It's probably not licensed, but you should get a shirt of Wario and Waluigi hugging. Oh, yes. <laughs> Because those are the only two representations of like the colors of the non-binary flag that I actually like because I hate the colors of the non-binary they, so flag. I was going to buy them a shirt with the non-binary flag on it and you go on, it was like on Tee Public or something. And then you go under the, like, the options and like you have to select a gender for the shirt to like, buy the <laughs> shirt. And I was like, hmm, hmm, hmm. no. <laughs> anyway, let's let's do the show thing that we were supposed to be doing. Um, <laughs> You're welcome for all the bonus content. Yeah, yeah no, it's um, fine. Uh, it's just going to go at the end of this episode anyway. So, yep. There you yeah. go. I'll have to. I'll have to throw one ah language in there, but that's about it. That's <laughs> you yeah, like using that one. Anyway. <laughs> I do like using that yeah, one. It's it, it's, it, the it's, best it's good bleep. for bonus content. <laughs> yeah, it, it it only belongs in the outtakes. And uh, like if I can if I can silence, I, I had to do this in the last episode uh, of series uh, 36 uh, where I, I literally just silenced the the bad word and it, mm-hmm. it almost sounds like just a hiccup in the audio recording, there you uh, go. which is fine. Yeah. All right. There we go. Stop. Pressing stop.